Okay. So we discussed a lot uh, today of the, the methodology of just-in-time sociology. I would like to kind of move the, your attention to another question, uh, which comes after the research are done, and it's the question of publication, how the result of just-in-time sociology, or in general, social sciences are diffused. And therefore, I will talk about scientific papers, and how scientific papers can evolve or change thanks to digital technologies. Um, as you know, uh, since uh, <coughs> some 10, more or less 10 years, uh, scientific publication have migrated online. Uh, and most of the time, our scientific papers are found not, on a, they're not papery anymore. They're, they're, they are become digital. There are many different reasons for this. Um, for the fact that this, the dissemination of scientific publication has gone digital. Um, but then they all have to do with the fact that it's much more convenient to disseminate, read, and store this kind of papers in, in a digital form. Um, if you are Elsevier, uh, for example, the publisher of the uh, Medical Hypothesis Journal, and you have in your hands this beautiful uh, article on ejaculation as a potential treatment of nasal congestion in mature male, it's actually a, a, a real example. Uh, is, you know, since you have the PDF of the uh, article, because the whole chain of peer review has also been done through computers, it's much, much more easier for you to just publish it online on your website instead of waiting for the journal to be printed, distributed to uh, libraries, libraries, and so on. Uh, at the same, in the same way, imagine that you are uh, the librarian of the British Library and you just built this, you know, a huge uh, book storage at, at Boston, at Boston, close to Boston, close to, to London, and, and you discover that you don't have enough space to store all the books and journals that you have. It, it's a dream for you to, you know, to, can, to, to be able to store articles and, new, and, and journals, scientific journals, not just in paper, but in a digital form that is much, much, uh, not necessarily easier, but less expensive to store and to keep. And finally, uh, also scholars, us, uh, we generally find, uh, I don't know what's your feeling about this, but we, you know, most scholars generally find it more convenient to store all their uh, papers on the hard drive or their computer and bring them uh, wherever they go without having to bring their library with them. So the fact that, uh, that papers have become digital has had many uh, important consequences already. Uh, three of them uh, are the most important. The, the first one is that uh, many journals have they start, they start profiting from the fact that they are publishing online to be uh, more just to be more just in time to publish more timely uh, the articles that are submitted to them instead of waiting uh, for the paper version to be out. Uh, now most uh, journal, at least the good one, uh, are already proposing an uh, online first publication, so the articles can be published on the website only a few months after uh, the peer review, not many months after the peer review. Uh, the second consequence is that there are a bunch of um, new tools for handling scientific literature that are becoming available for, uh, for scientists, both uh, in the back end, in the front end, let's say. Uh, just to give you a couple of examples of two tools that are freely available. Um, though not open source. Uh, the first one is, is Google so Scholar, you probably know, it's the Google search engine for scientific literature. And, and the second one is Mendeley, which, which is also a free tool uh, for storing on your computer and retrieving your own literature. So uh, the development of these tools, and there are many more, uh, and, and the fact that they are becoming more and more uh, interoperable makes it easier and easier to be able to handle a, growing amount of scientific literature. And the third and probably the most important uh, consequence of, uh, of this digitalization of scientific literature is the all open access movement. Uh, thanks to, well, since the digitization of 
scientific articles, scholars discover that they could easily do the work that has been done up until now so far by, by publisher and actually became, become the very you do have to think about new solutions that are able to both uh, be able to assure the same standard of citability, accessibility, durability and stability that were, uh, that were assured by traditional publishing but they can also add to this the multimedia and, and, and the multimedia and interactive feature or potentialities that are so interesting about digital technologies. Um, in the you know in the last in the second the second and last part of my of my talk, I would like to sort of make a proposal of what we could come up with. Um, I think that the technologies um, the technology that could allow this new type of publication, this new type of digital publication, already exists. There are very little, so nowadays there are very little technical obstacles to uh, imagining this kind of publication. Um, precisely because uh, web technologies have uh, developed very much in the last few years, and since the very beginning they were, they have been inspired by scientific publications. So, for example, this is a play that you can uh, say where the web was born, and as you probably know, it's in the, uh, CERN, the CERN library. Uh, so the web, the web technology was born having scientific publication as a very clear and explicit reference, which makes that uh, it's actually pretty easy to reuse web technology to do scientific publication. So to go through the, uh, the principle that I just listed, so citability, uh, accessibility, durability, and stability, multimedia interactivity, um, the first one, uh, citability, is actually very well implemented in web technology through the URL systems. Uh, as you know, URLs uh, are, considered, are considered one of the most important technology in uh, the whole digital environment because they allow to uh, without ambiguity, identify one specific resource on the internet. Uh, and there's more, uh, and there's more than that, because URLs also allowed, they are scalable. They allow different level of granularity. As in a traditional paper, you can cite the journal, the paper, uh, a specific par uh, paragraph in the paper, or even a specific line or set of words. Uh, in the URLs, you can quote the, the name of the domain, the subdomains, the folders, uh, the subfolders, uh, and, and up to anchor. So you can be very, very precise in which element you want to cite. And this can be stabilized. The whole, the whole movement of permalink, permanent link, have been developed precisely to be able to allow, to, uh, to allow the stabilization of URL. The second uh, principle of scientific publication that can be implemented in, in, in the web is the accessibility. So the possibility to make easily accessible the result that have been published uh, in scientific literature. I think that the best uh, chance that we have to assure accessibility on the web is to rely on web standards and to comply with the accessibility directive of the, uh, of the uh, W3C, the consortium that creates and, and discuss the standards of the web. Uh, the advantage of the standards uh, of the web is that they are more or less and to a great extent uh, implemented by all the browsers available uh, in, in both on laptops, computer and on mobile devices. So if the articles are published in standard technology they, are probably, they will probably be readable for all the possible devices. The third principle is the durability. So the possibility uh, to make, to, uh, to be sure that an article that is published remains the same for a long time. And then the cost of maintenance is limited. Uh, web standards also um, may also be, play an important role uh, for this. And especially uh, the latest web standard, the HTML5, because there has been a lot of, a lot of efforts has been put in HTML5 to assure 
both the forward compatibility of the standard, meaning that something that you do in HTML5 today will be readable in the next 10, 20, probably more uh, years, but also backward compatibility, in the sense that the HTML5 have been, have been developed so that things that are published in this language uh, degrade gracefully in older browser. They can be read also by older browser. So even browsers that were developed before HTML5 are able to read uh, documents published in HTML5. And also HTML, as you probably know, uh, it's, um, it's a markup uh, language, which means that the text is always at the core of the HTML file, and then you have markups that add style and, and multimedia elements to the to the page, but at the very bottom you can print the source of an HTML page and it will be human readable. So at the very bottom, uh, HTML5 is at least in part retro compatible even with paper technology. Uh, and then there's the last, uh, uh, the last principle of the traditional uh, publishing, which is stability. The fact of being able to assure that once published, the article will remain the same. This is probably the most uh, problematic point in web uh, publication because web publication has moved to a completely different type of stability. Stability exists as well in online environment, but it has a completely different sense. Stability in online environment means versioning, not, stop, not freezing uh, one document, but being able to trace all uh, the version that have been done to that. And for example, that's the solution will be used by Wikipedia, but also by all the, uh, all the open source uh, development, development movement. Um, I think, though, that at least for a scientific publication, even though this kind of stability is also worth trying and it may give interesting, interesting results, I think that uh, this is a completely different way of conceiving uh, stability that, does not, that is not suitable uh, for scientific publication. Because in, the, in Wikipedia and this, this kind of um, type of publishing, um, the, the idea is that the, the, the validation and the enhancement of the publication comes after the publication itself. You first publish uh, an article on Wikipedia, and then it's ameliorated by someone else, or criticized, or, or validated, and so on and so forth. Whereas in scientific, in scientific literature, the idea is that first the results are validated by peer review, and once they are published, they are freezed in this form. So I think that for the sake of citability and durability, it is important to uh, not to follow the web on this thing, on the versioning, but, but on the contrary to freeze the articles, even digital one, once they are, once they are published. And then, of course, um, and then of course, digital technology allows multimedia and interactivity. Uh, and especially uh, HTML5, because, because as you probably know, uh, where web technology were not originally conceived for being interactive and for being multimedia. They, they, they used to be, web technology were conceived for being hypertextual, which is something else. But, but soon, the fact that you can click on an element on a, on a page and move to another, to something else, to another page, to another part of the page, have developed many, uh, at, 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 at produced the development of uh, interactivity, of many interactive, uh, many interactive uh, use of the web. And at the same time, the fact that you can embed a document within another document. In fact, for example, you can embed an image in the original HTML, you can embed an image within a text. Also open up the possibility for multimedia, because uh, more and more uh, web users started to embed everything uh, every type of media within, within the pages. Uh, HTML5, once again, uh, marks an important step forward, forward in this sense because it sort of acknowledged the importance of interactivity and multimedia uh, for the web, for the web communication, and moves them from other technologies that were not standard. Uh, as you know, most of the uh, interactivity on the web was made through Flash, which is a non-standard technology. And, and also most of the multimedia, in fact, HTML5 is trying to move this uh, to, to sort of allow uh, 
content producer to do the same thing with web standards. It is also possible to imagine more sophisticated uh, way of publishing. And just to give you a, an example, uh, this, there is it's very important, there are very interesting projects called AppZero.org, uh, which is made to um, promote collaborative science, not necessarily collaborative and digital, digital science, not necessarily publication, uh, which is trying to sort of building uh, the, the channels uh, that, that allows to sort of publish it through the web any type of technology. Because the idea is that web standards, web technology are very interesting and they allow us to do many, uh, to, to do a, lot of, a lot of things in terms of the algorithm that you can use for the analysis, in terms of visualization, in terms of multimedia. But there's still many interesting technology like R, for example, that was added to the a lot like Python, like PHP, like other technologies. They're not web standards, but they are currently used in uh, they are currently used in, in research. But they are not they are not web. They are not web. They cannot be diff they cannot be easily diffused online. And so App Zero is trying to build the sort of the, the buffer that allows to retransmit all this through Java app to Java applets. So through web technology, basically. But still, even just using web standard and HTML5, I think that it can be, uh, we can easily, uh, as I try to, as I try to, to show you, uh, we can easily uh, comply with the uh, requirements of accessibility, citability, uh, durability, and stability of traditional scientific publication, and add and open up much, much more possibility in multimedia and interactive for scientific publication. Thank you very much. Questions? Yeah. Uh, I think that behind this, there is a problem that everybody is facing these days, developing competencies uh, in colleagues general in researchers to deal with these topics, how would you tackle that? Uh, how would you uh, face that problem? Because I mean, paper, yes, of course, has a lot of problem, but everybody, more or less, after five years, uh, five hundred years, sorry, of uh, printed paper, more or less can read. But not everybody can, can, can yeah. develop their own. Yeah, that's a big, that's a big, well, I, I think that uh, this is sort of a twofold question. That's the problem of the production, being able to produce this kind of result, this kind of visualization, uh, which is not a big problem, I think. In the sense that there are more and more scholars that are able to do so. And, and I mean, I think that this kind of, this type of publication can be sort of addressed to those, to those people. Not necessarily everyone has to publish to this. I mean, I, I still think that traditional paper, papers will will remain. The idea is to provide something else. But there's another part of your question, which is what about the sort of the competencies to read this paper, which is a much, much, much bigger problem. Because um, in, in, as for scientific text, you are totally right. We sort of built a whole tradition, 200 year tradition of how to read a scientific paper, how to be, how it has to be structured. If you want to look the methods, you know where to find them. If you want to look or the conclusion you don't know where to find and so on and so forth, which is not the case in this. In this. So, and, and this sort of these traditions, this uh, convention do not exist. Not only that a lot of people don't, don't know them, they do not exist at all. They have to be invented, they have to be standardized, and they have to be stabilized. So I think that it would sort of probably take 200 years, like, I don't know, at least quite some years. But if you don't start, Published in this way, we will never develop uh, the convention that will eventually be able to allow us to use them as we use the same traditional paper. Yeah. Uh, jean -Marc, Yes, you talk about uh, your to yeah. identify <laughs> objects. Uh, why don't you talk about the About? DOE. 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 Yeah. Why don't you talk about? DOE is, a, is also very interesting. It's also a very interesting uh, technology. 
uh, which we have, with, which has to be used with together with URLs. The problem with the OI is that it's not scalable. The OI is, can only be used to refer to one article. You cannot use it to refer to a part with uh, um, something within the article. If the article is a paper article, no problem. You can say, okay, that's the article, the page is, is one, or you can say the text. But imagine the article, imagine the product, the article is the, uh, for example, the, the nice maps that we just saw in the presentation uh, on, on uh, anorexia. Uh, and if you want to cite one of the cluster, how do you cite them with the OI? With the OI? It's impossible. But you can with URL. So that's why I think that the two should be used together. Um, I'm thinking about the fact that um, now more and more journals are requiring authors to, uh, in addition with the article, to provide like their data or code or um, additional materials. Um, yeah. And you see this proliferation of companion sites here and there. So I wonder whether the solution you have in mind would also be able to integrate all these different resources into something that is perhaps more easily searchable for users or readers than having to look around uh, like uh, companion materials and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I do think, I do think that, um, that the data and the code should be uh, published with the results. Uh, because I think that the, the easiest way to find them and the easiest way to assure that they will be found with the results is that they are published together. Unfortunately, this is not the case, as you said, this is not the case together, uh, today. Uh, because most of the time you publish the article in the paper version on a, on a website, and then there are other websites that allows to publish, uh, to publish the data or the code, and so forth. I think that everything should be moved together. Uh, there are some, I have to, there are, there are some uh, reviews, there are journals that are moving these are Science, for example, also allows, uh, also, encourage um, scholars to publish their code on the website of science itself. So I, th I think that that's, that's a good, good direction. Yeah. yeah I, think, uh, I have two questions. Uh, both are a little bit heuristic. I don't know uh, uh, how to cope with that. The first thing is uh, if uh, uh, I publish the um, paper uh, online in, in journal, who has the duty to save it in durable form uh, 100, 200 years? Uh, it, how, how it is uh, uh, from, from, uh, from the point of view of the, of the duty of that? Uh, that uh, could be problematic for, for, the, for the next generation because of if Newton wrote something and published that, and, or, or Kepler, it's no problem now. Uh, and the second, um, my experience from the school, from many universities, uh, is uh, that in the last five or seven years, students don't sign the uh, papers which uh, give to, to, the, to the teacher, and also don't sometimes don't use the name. They, they get the seminar paper or sometimes not not better <laughs> yeah it's the stones of post but give seminar paper without names give presentation without names and uh, this is something uh, which is maybe uh, close to the problem of plagiarism i don't say that they they do plagiarism but uh, sometimes the identification with the text is maybe changing. I don't know if how much is it uh, attached to the uh, to the um, mode in in which the publication are. But uh, uh, how how to uh, can you say something about this? Thanks. Yeah, sure. So uh, the first question is a very uh, very important one. I think uh, who 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 is in charge? Of uh, storing and conserving uh, the scientific publication, I think that uh, at least so far the, the the answer remains libraries. But I think that this kind of new type of publication that I'm sort of envisioning uh, that we are discussing today 
uh, can make the life of libraries library easier. Because what, what, is what is happening today is that, I'm sure most of you already had this experience, that you find an interesting paper somewhere, and you say, okay, so they are citing a URL, but I can actually see the algorithm that they use, or they can actually see the animation that they're describing. You go to the, the URLs, and it doesn't work. Why? Because it was on the web server of the, uh, of the department where the author used to work, and then he moved to change university. So the old department closed down, they closed down the server, they lost. So that's, that's not a good way of, of, of making sure that science will remain uh, in centers. I think that if publication is, so if the publication of digital results is of uh, concentrated on the website of the publishers, it will also be much, much more much, much easier for libraries to collect this kind of the results and store them. If these findings are disseminated on a myriad of different websites, on the web, personal website of the researcher doing the research, on the department website, whatever, it would be much, much more difficult for a library to be able to assure the stabilization of knowledge. So that's for the first question. For the second one, um, that's a huge question. I'm not sure that I have a, that I, that I have a complete answer, but it's sure that uh, this type of publication, like versioning, like on, on Wikipedia, are completely redefining the whole notion of authorship. But what, what, who is the author of a, of a Wikipedia page? That's a very difficult question to answer. Um, and that's, that's also why, at least in these four phases, in the first step, I'm, I'm sort of saying let's not go in too much in this direction. Uh, I would not recommend to, uh, to add versioning to scientific publishing, but I would prefer freezing. Also because there are many reasons, but one is that it allows to sort not to undermine, at least not too quickly, the notion of authorship, which is still very important in scientific community. I think there's, uh, there's two other big topics that, uh, that, that are related. One is that you know, I think as researchers, we oftentimes would like to see continuity and recognition of our work. And so uh, I'm not sure whether you're proposing a kind of revolutionary kind of approach to the publishing, publishing of uh, our research papers. Um, maybe a evolution approach is, is uh, preferred because uh, yeah. You don't want to see the citation suddenly disappear <laughs> <laughs> because of some strange reasons. Uh, perhaps, let's say, the publisher you know, could not survive, the existing one could not survive, and just you know, gave up, and as a result, we, we lose a lot of uh, information. And then the other issue is about, uh, again, related to the uh, publishing model, because uh, the existing publishing uh, business is a big industry. And so I think it's, it does takes time to move from one business model to another. So I'm not sure whether you have uh, uh, thought through these two uh, issues and, and, and have any idea how we can proceed uh, yeah. in a careful way. Yeah. These are two very good questions. Uh, it is sure that just sort of making this technology available will, would, will serve to nothing if scholars that would publish in such type of publication. I'm not sure that their work is citable, first of all, but also that it can be as valuable as normal publication. Continuity, I think, is important. It's continuity, but it's also, it's, it's also more than that. It's, it's more, uh, it's from a very practical point of view, scholars want to be able to increase their age, the age index, the age index, for example, because it, it has an impact on their career. So there, there might be, or there, there will be, for sure, um, reticent to publish in, in, in such a journal, if such a journal do not assure that the, that the publication, that, that this kind of digital publication, has the same value of continuity, of suitability, of traditional publication. Uh, and I think this, is, this can only be done with the help of uh, 
or at least it would be much, much more difficult to do, to do so without the help of an existing publisher because they have an established tradition of assuring this continuity, of sort of being sure that the articles are account, accountable and counted in uh, the database that I use to calculate H index in my practice. Uh, so the, 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 the sort of the path that I am exploring now is to, um, there's, a new, um, there's a new journal that will be launched probably in 2014, which is called Big Data and Sociology, which will be about computational social sciences. And I'm, I'm working with the chief editor and the publisher, which is Sage, to see if part of this journal can be delivered this way. So if the thing goes well, we'll see it's a long, it's a long shot and it's a long journey. But if thing goes well, the idea is that the, there will be a, a normal journal with normal papers, and then some of the articles of the journal will be only digital, and then will allow all this uh, new potential of interactivity and multidimensional, while assuring the same requisites of citability, accountability, and so on and so forth. Other questions? Okay, so I suggest we do uh, now a short pause, uh, because it's been, it's been a rather long session, uh, and uh, we, we come back, uh, all of us, at, uh, for, for the other one, at uh, uh, 4.30, uh, with a discussion. Uh, during the discussion, we're going to discuss two things. Uh, one is the, um, the follow-up of...